there was going to be a Noah sermon. It's kind of been abbreviated because Noah, go figure, right? <laughs> Noah texts me this morning. What time did you text me? It, yeah, right, uh-huh. 4.47 a.m. Yeah. Hey man, just got back from the U.S. into the U.S. Friday. I can't even begin to explain what the Lord did in Malawi. How do you Malawi, Malawi, Malawi Africa, <laughs> with the message of repentance. The hunger for God and His Word was mind blowing. I saw I saw thousands come to Christ for the first time and physical healings with my own eyes. Can't wait to talk to you more. Here's a video. Of what God is doing. You're going to hear from Noah and Heather this morning. And I hope you don't have plans, and I don't mind if we go long first and second service because this is important of what God is doing. It's important for where we are. And folks, we need to wake up. We really honestly do. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace in addition to all this take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god and pray in the spirit we forget about the spirit right and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the saints. Grab your Bibles. Genesis chapter 6. When you find Genesis chapter 6, stand to your feet. Verse 1, we will read all the way down to verse 8. And then I will speak briefly, and then we will allow Noah and Heather to come up and just speak about what they are seeing the Lord do. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, if you're there, say amen. amen. Lee Twist, are you there? You're good, buddy. Verse 1, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of this earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at your scriptures. Lord Jesus, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would teach us the truth from these passages. Lord, show us the condition of the earth and humanity that caused you to grieve in such a manner that total annihilation was the only option. Father, wake us up. Holy Spirit, teach us. Minister to us. 
wake us and shake us to the mission which Jesus died for, to seek and to save that which was lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord in heaven. It's amazing that Paul in Ephesians tells us to put on the full armor of God, and he tells us that we are not struggling or wrestling or fighting against flesh and blood, meaning you and me. There is a different type of battle going on, and it's in the spiritual realm. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And so you look at today. You, you look at today, and everybody says, are we in the end times? Are we in the end times? When did the end times start? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Right now, we are in the end times. So God's plan to bring about the end of what we know as the world has been set in motion. It's been in motion for a long time. And everybody thinks that things are supposed to get better, right? Is that the case? Now, is that doom and gloom? Oh, Drew, you're, you're the half-empty glass, right? Instead of half... No, is, is that the truth? It's supposed to get worse before it gets better. In fact, the church age will end in the three and a half years of the tribulation and then the three and a half years of the great tribulation, boom, Christ will come back, redeem his church. That's what I believe because that is classical premillennialism. That is the, the view that has stood the test of time until the 1900s when man began to advise, well, certainly God won't put us through the tribulation. Oh, really? What makes us so sure that Americans will just be when persecution has been going on across the globe for years? Wake up, America. We are not the center of God's vision. We're not the spoiled child. God's plan is about redemption, and his plan has been put in place and will carry out. And we should not be scared of the sign of the times, but we should know the sign of the times. How does it look on the outside of these walls? How does it look on the outside of Christianity? Does it look like people are doing well and behaving and loving and honoring and worshiping God? Or does it look like Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3? What, what does it look like? I'm just asking some questions today. Does it look good out there? What is taking over in the world? What? Sin. What kind of sin? Greed. Lust. What else? What? Pride. Witchcraft. We are a sexualized community, are we not? Everything in America is about what? Sex, money, leisure, genitalia. Explain that later, okay? But I'm serious. Think about where we are. We are so hung up on a sexualized world. Everywhere you turn, it gets worse and worse. And I'm not just talking a little bit. I'm talking a lot. Would you agree? We're so now focused on gender, on reassignment, on alternative lifestyles. If you have a headache, you must now need to change your gender. If you're having a bad day, the only option for you is to become something that you're not. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad, is it not? It's almost as if it's demonic. People walking into stores, shooting people up, shooting police, honoring the wicked. Anybody see the Dodgers game? We won't even go there, but I've got to touch on these things to show us how depraved we're becoming. Yeah. 
And as Americans, we preach these, hey, you know what, everything's going to work out for you. We preach this man-centered gospel that it's all about us. I had a conversation with somebody in this church that called me and said, hey, is this person not a good person to use their Bible studies? And I said, you know what? No, they're not. Because they are known for idolatry of self. Everything is about themselves or man getting the health that they need, the wealth that they deserve, the prosperity that everybody should have in the kingdom of God. It all works out in the end. Here, this is the best life now. That's the American view of Jesus and the gospel. But that is not. The American dream is the antithesis to the gospel. And so we're facing this cliff that we're all walking over as society and as states and as the country. We're going off the cliff as a sexualized, demonic nation. And nobody seems to be pumping the brakes. I mean, do you see anybody pushing the brake on, wait a minute, time out? No, in fact, our, our, our county just north of us has become a sanctuary county and Madison as a whole is going to follow suit and become a sanctuary city for all those wanting reassignment. And the police are to make investigation the lowest priority. And everybody's like, yes, 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 for six-year-olds, for seven-year-olds, for ten, from all over, come and be protected. When men began to increase in number on the earth, you have to understand now we've seen the line of Seth live on Methuselah 969 years, and then you see people continuing to live after Methuselah lived 969, and then he died. Then Lamech had lived 182 years. He had this son. He named him Noah, and he said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toils of our, of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived another 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, I don't think that's the order of birth. I think Japheth was first, but I'm not sure you can check that for yourself. So there's a, a long period of time has gone by, maybe 1600, 1650. I don't know. A lot of years have gone by. So you can imagine the population at this time. It's exploded. There are people all over the place. All over the place. And so when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. And, you know, people, a lot, there, there's so many views on all of these scriptures we're not going to dive into them today because i want to get to noah and heather but it's easy to think that because there was the line of cain and the line of seth that that's exactly what is happening here that when the men increased on the earth and the daughters were born to them the sons of god maybe the line of seth the godly line of seth saw that the daughters of men or the line of cain were beautiful and they married any of them that they chose maybe what's happening here is that we have the godly line of seth intermarrying with the ungodly line of cain thus corrupting the genetics and doing exactly what the lord commands his people not to do is to intermarry and then we get this race of corruption But the oldest, most historical view of these passages, such as Philo and Josephus and Tertullian, all believed back in the day, those who walked with Jesus, is that these were demonic angels that came down. And we're going to talk about those next week because I have an entire outline that I want to go through. But it also ties in passages of Scripture such as 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, for one purpose, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. 
through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And then if you look at 2 Peter 2, 4, 5, and 9, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a heralder or proclaimer of righteousness, with seven others, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials. And also Jude 6, and the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. In a similar way, what these angels did, Sodom and Gomorrah And the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. When the men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, men are having relations and daughters are born to them, The sons of God, which is also termed the spirits, in Job chapter 1, I think verse 6, 2 verse 1 of Job, as well as Job 38, I believe it's verse 7, spirit and sons of God are used interchangeably, but they're always used to define spirits. In these passages here, we're talking about unholy, fallen spirits. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men, could it be 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and Jude are talking about these angels, these demonic fallen angels that left their position they were to be in and they came down and they intermarried or came and absorbed because angels, according to Matthew chapter 22, in the resurrection, what does it say? People will neither marry nor be given in Mary. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now it's talking about righteous angels. They will not marry or be given into Mary, so therefore they will not probably procreate. It doesn't say that they're sexless. It just says that the godly angels, we will be like that in the end. We will neither marry or be given in marriage like the angels. Well, these are fallen angels, and fallen angels or demonic spirits, if you remember when Jesus cast out the spirits from the, from the, the, the demoniac, what did they want to do? They wanted to go into pigs. When, the, when you clean up your heart and the spirits leave, they wander to and fro in arid places looking for somewhere to reside, right? But what do they do? They, they can't find somewhere. They come back, find the house swept and cleaned. And what do they do? They move back in because you did not invite Jesus in and they bring in more powerful. So can spirits have relations with people probably not so what do they need to do they need to possess somebody this is a picture of what seems to be happening back in the day of noah that fallen angels are coming down and they're possessing as we would be like oh does that really happen well yes jesus went to the gerizim demoniac We have these possessed individuals by spirits that are trying to act in a way to corrupt humanity. Now, why would the enemy try to corrupt humanity? I ain't got time. Come on. What did God promise in Genesis 3, verse 15? The gospel message, right? The seed of the woman, right? will do what he will bruise and crush right he will bruise his heel and crush the head of the serpent the seed of the woman oh you've got this world that's being populated by many people and the enemy never giving up his only hope is to what extinguish all the way through the old testament the seed of the woman look at what pharaoh did 
Look at how many times they tried to kill all the males. Look at what happened to Samson. Look at it, look at it, look at it. So you have this demonic fallen realm of spirits coming down to earth, inhabiting whoever they can to use them to corrupt the seed of the woman and to corrupt all of humanity. The sons of God or the spirits saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Here we have a godless world. They're doing whatever they want. There's no reference to God. These people are living a, 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 a wantless life, a lust-filled life. They're being controlled by spiritual realms, which we just hear about in Ephesians chapter 6, and we gloss over it like, tuck that away because that's ooky spooky to me. No, Paul's trying to wake us up to the fact that there is a dimension that we do not fully understand, and yet we gloss over it. You mean there's, yes, men, women, children, there are demonic forces looking to derail you and to defile you so that you do not now grab hold of the seed of the woman that will crush the head and bruise his heel. That is King Jesus. What is the enemy doing back here in the Old Testament? Trying to stop the forthcoming godly seed of the woman that will bring redemption to all mankind. So his plan is to corrupt the world they came down and they saw that men that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose any of them and the lord said my spirit will not contend with men forever or my spirit will not shield men forever my spirit will not give the grace of protection on men forever For he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. Boom. Something is coming in 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God or these spirits went to the daughters of men and had children by them. And the actual Hebrew there is that when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them so these spirits saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married or they took any of them that they chose it's almost like a picture of what the garden all over again trying to cause the fall of humanity again in a way that the seed cannot come through anybody on planet earth ha <laughs> ha gotcha god you can't bring a seed they saw, they took, and they come into, meaning that union. Somehow the spirits now are indwelling fallen humanity, corrupt humanity, who has forgotten about God, and they are now celestially doing whatever they want, filled and ratified and driven by lust. Sound familiar? I mean, does it sound familiar? Demonic influences sexualizing people to do the deranged and demonic over and over and over again to corrupt humanity. Man, do we need to open our eyes? And we say it's for the child's betterment, health, and safety. We pass laws to protect these procedures, these lifestyles, which degrade and kill humanity and we're not just isolating and picking on these sexualized sins but it seems to be they're not promoting lying you're supposed to say yes they are <laughs> look at social media they're not promoting murder Gosh, do you see what is happening around us? Why am I the only, why? Why does it torment me at night? Because we come into church and we hear these fuzzy messages that mean nothing to people. It doesn't wake us and shake us, but when we get down to what, what might make us question and go, is that really what it's saying? Nobody wants to investigate 
Nobody wants to check like the Bereans did. Dig in. Well, you only dig into what the words are. Dig into what, what, what it says. Dig into the Hebrew. Dig into history. Dig into what other scholars thought. Wake up to the sign of the time. They are promoting everything that Jesus said is sin. I don't care if it's lying, murder, adultery, homosexuality. It's all being promoted as the way to live. Why? Because the, the enemy is inhabiting and possessing and ruling people and driving them to bring the demonic not of America, but of humanity. And God said, My spirit will not contend with men forever, for he is mortal. His days are 120. These giants, these fallen ones, were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men went into and had children with them. They were the heroes of old, the men of renown. They were looked up to. This is how sick it got. These perverted men, these mighty men of perversion, indwelt by the enemy, they were looked up to. Some say they were the offspring of the byproduct of the angels, the fallen angels, with humanity. But these probably were the driven spirits that were inhabiting these men and forcing them and driving them to do these things. They were looked up to. They were commended for all that they did to perpetuate all of this. Looked up to men of renown. Know anybody like that today? The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become and that every inclination and thought, that everything that he did was forming like the potter does the clay is what that word means. That every inclination and the forming of his heart was only evil all the time. What a, what a judgment. There was no, there's no good. It was so depraved and so wicked and demonically oppressed and influenced that it couldn't be fixed. The only measure that God saw that he could do with man that left any kind of reliance on God or glorifying or work, that man that was totally left to himself became so infiltrated by the demonic, there was nothing left that God, he was grieved and broken. And so what was the remedy? Not to send them for some more government help. Annihilation. Why? Why? Because the seed had been so corrupted that there was no one left to choose from to bring the godly seed of Jesus. No one knows about the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Humanity even promoted the giving of their daughters to the wicked. Do not be unequally yoked. What does... Satan and righteousness have in common nothing. What does light have to do with darkness? They were even promoted. Take my daughter! Just like crazy Lot said to the wicked generation before him who wanted to have sex with the angels. Hey, I've got some virgin daughters. Take what in the world? For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in a marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Folks, wake up. God brings a flood. 
But guess what? Because God is a God who always has a what? Remnant. Noah was decrepit probably, had some wicked thoughts and probably fell into some things, but you know what? Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. What does that mean? Noah found grace. That word is grace. He was about to get what he didn't deserve. The grace of God saw him as righteous. Why? Because he had a heart inclined to do what God asked him to do. He listened to the word of God. He obeyed the word of God. And by faith, he served God wholeheartedly men of God that's who we need to be men who are willing to do what God asks us to do as we listen and talk with him obey him and by faith serve him and repent when need be God is giving us the warning signs God is showing us America wake up there is the end in sight. Now, I don't know when it is because no one knows the day, right? The hour. No one knows the time when Jesus is coming back, but he is coming back. And he is preparing people. And he is bringing people to repentance because it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. And God is doing something. He is moving to Malawi. And so, Noah and Heather, you've got 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Get us out of here by 25 after. Okay? There will be no closing song, worship team, so you all can rest assured at that, all right? Because this is amazing. But do we begin to see, do we begin to grab hold and grapple with what is happening around us? Don't be blind to it. But even in the midst of all that's happening out there in the world, which it's supposed to be, you have been chosen for such a time as this to do what? To carry forth the good news, whether it's across your bedroom to your spouse, across to the other bedrooms to your kids, across the lawn to your neighbor, across the street, across state lines, across the country, across the seas. We are called to go and share. Well, nobody cares about God anymore. Nobody's repenting. Oh, please, let us, let us hear, right? Yeah. I could listen to that all day long. Well, praise the Lord for Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord for the King. Uh, I just felt this morning, we are going to talk about Malawi, Africa, uh, but I really felt this morning uh, the Lord told me to bring some wristbands. How many of you have wristbands? Your wristbands up real high. There we go. Okay. So I felt led just to go through the simple gospel. I think sometimes this can get really complicated. But the message this morning, I really felt in my spirit, is to just go through the simple gospel. How many of you heard of the simple gospel? Raise your hand. Okay, some of you not. So I wanna go through something very basic that changed my life, okay? So on your wristband, look at the color yellow. All these colors represent one word. Just think of it as one word of the Bible, right? So there's five words that I want you to kind of remember. Yellow stands for sin. And it says in Romans, what is that? Romans 3.23. I'm sorry, I got to walk around. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So yellow stands for sin, and not just some, but it says all. I don't know about you, but like that's, that's like peace of mind for me. Pastor Drew sins. Tom, probably one of the bigger sinners here. <laughs> Myself, sinner, right? All of us. So all have sinned. Yellow stands for what? Sin. Our sin in our life has consequences. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, it has consequences. It actually leads to death. And it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So for my wage, is wage is something that we earn. Y'all work, right? We work to, to get a wage. So for our sin, we have to pay a wage. And the wage that we have to pay is what? Yeah. Not good news. You see, there was a lot of my life. I sat in sin and death. And I never knew red, which is the love, the demonstration that he has for us. And that while I was sinning and leading to death, he died for us, Right? Love takes away the what and the right. Those are the three words. The fourth word is blue. It stands for faith. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. 
It's not of yourself, right? It's a gift. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's almost as if uh, you have a birthday and somebody gives you a present. You didn't do anything for the present. You received the present. Grace going above and beyond what we don't deserve. How many have never really looked at it that way? Be honest with me because I didn't for a long time. How many of you heard this for the very first time right now? It's a free gift. Raise your hand high, please. Four, yeah, blue is faith, right? Just receiving it. You didn't do anything for it. There's nothing that I can do to make him love me any more than he already does right now. That's a lot of pressure off of us, but you do need to receive it. And then the fifth word is life. If I have faith, I have life. And this is the key. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. There's two action words in the first sentence. It's confess and believe that he's Lord. What is Lord? That's a big word. We don't use it anymore. Lord is in charge. Some of you rent. You have a landlord. You can't do anything before you ask who? The landlord. How many of you heard this for the first time right now like this? It's very possible, yeah. It's very possible to know Jesus, but not to truly know Jesus. Yeah. But the action words, it's almost like in court. The judge says, how do you want to plead? You have to confess, not guilty. You can't just look at your head and nod. You confess him to be Lord. So right now, I want you to bow your heads. Is there anyone in here right now that have never asked, and nobody's looking, that has never asked Jesus to be in charge of their life? Lord of my life, Lord of my decisions. It's probably the most important question that you'll ever be asked because we're all destined to die. Every single one of us, as your eyes are closed, is there anyone here right now that wants to confess and to be Lord? Raise your hand high. Yes, thank you. Yes. So if that's you, I just want you to repeat after me. And it's as easy as this. Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life. And I trust in you. And I recognize that I'm not perfect. But you came on a cross. And I trust in you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's for somebody this morning. I just felt it on my heart. Now let's talk about Malawi and what the Lord is doing. So this started with a dream of Kyle, uh, our, our founder of our ministry called Time to Revive. Uh, we love to come in and equip the church on how it looks like to live life on mission with five words, right? There's a lot of ways to do it. It's just a tool. I actually believe your testimony is the most important thing and the powerful thing that you'll ever share with somebody. But I want you to know that dreams are for today. I think of uh, Genesis 15 where Moses fall, Abraham falls into a sleep. Abraham? Abraham falls into a sleep. And the Lord says to him, through a dream, you will go into a foreign land, right? It's actually through a dream he confirmed that. In Acts 2, Peter says to, through Joel, old men will dream dreams, young men will have visions. This is for today. Okay, just to let you know, dreams still happen. So Kyle, about a year, uh, a little over a year ago, has a dream. And in this dream, he is calling the country of Malawi to repentance. He sees a stadium full of Africans. And next to him is the president of Malawi. And he wakes up from this dream. And so he writes this down. And he sends it off to the government of Malawi. See, we already have a presence in Africa because of Revive School, which is a two-year biblical study seeing the Messiah all the way through Genesis to Revelation. It's a free school. We just want to get the Word of God in people's hands. So we are already in Africa, and we have some groups in Malawi. So when President La uh, Lazarus Chukwera sees this come across his desk, he says to his spiritual advisor, contact Kyle. I think this is a word from the Lord for Malawi, my nation. So Kyle says, or the, the president says to Kyle, I want to meet in New York City. 
So Kyle flies out to New York City, and the president says, I will be behind this 100%. He is a believer, by the way. He says, I'll be behind you 100% if you can get the church of Malawi on board. If you can't get the church of Malawi on board, I don't think it's of the Lord. There's 20 million people in Malawi. It's a nation. So he flies out. About two months later, word gets out. 4,000 pastors show up to a meeting. President uh, President catches wind of this and says, I am behind you 100% because I think it's God calling our nation to repent. So that's how it got started. So Kyle meets with these pastors. We call them the seven, seven pastors who are already leading Revive School. And what would it look like for us to come in to Malawi and do a four-city crusade? Our, our ministry doesn't do crusades, but we know it's of the Lord. I'll have Heather talk a little bit about that uh, actually right now. So while we were there, uh, we went into these four cities. Uh, In the mornings, we would send out teams. Um, We would send out teams to the schools. We would send out teams uh, to the prisons. We would send out teams to the farms. We had someone who would be... um, teaching to the pastors. We would have another group teaching to the counselors. And this would happen every morning. We would share the gospel. We would go out in the message of repentance. We would feed them spiritually, and we would also physically uh, bring things to them. And so we would do that, and then we would come together in the evening uh, for the crusades to hear the message of repentance there. And so um, for me, I got to go out to the prisons um, and just really really preach uh, the message of repentance and the salvation of Jesus. And so that's what it looked like while we were there. We also, um, while we were there, an important part to know is that we we have revived school leaders all over in different nations in Africa. So we brought in about 120 of those leaders, and we did a three-day leadership conference with them uh, where they actually got to be involved with what we were doing um, so they could catch what it could look like for the message of repentance in their own countries. Uh, that finalized with the uh, president of Malawi um, actually invited us all to the palace where we got to come and pray over him, a man of God who is truly calling his nation to repentance, and then a commissioning to send those um, 120 leaders back out into their own nations uh, to share the message. So we'll wait upon the fruit to see what happens with that. I'll let Noah share some of the testimonies of what happened. Uh, This is the exciting part of how God is moving and what it looks like when people do fall to their knees um, and repent to their father. Yeah, so we ended up going to the prisons. Heather kind of got to go to the prisons. We actually got involved in the school system, too, uh, sharing the gospel with kids. And, and we're talking uh, three or 4,000 kids uh, a day heard the message uh, of, of Jesus. And we also got to go to the farms. And then I was in charge of, me and a crew were in charge of training uh, what we would call counselors because people at the end of the night are going to give their life to the Lord. But the reality is, is we don't want to just make converts. We want to get them plugged in to discipleship. It's key. So we would actually, when we go out and share in the community, we have these cards. So we would fill out their name and they would do a two-year school, which is free, and then we get them plugged into a group. So they're not just converting, but they're actually getting the word of God. So I was in charge of the counselors, uh, which is weird, but there's about 850 to 1,200 counselors that showed up every morning. In fact, when we would go to the stadium, they were waiting for us. And it was just amazing to see the hunger Uh, of these counselors. And I think there's actually some pictures, Barry, or somebody. Yeah, so there's the school. Look at the kids. Unbelievable the amount of kids that were there. We always had interpreters uh, coming too. So that was the school system. Uh, That was an everyday thing. Okay, so here's, uh, here is a lady that is a Muslim. That's my interpreter right now. So we're preaching to her, telling her about Jesus. And she's 19 years old and she can't move her arm, can't move her wrist at all. And we explain the gospel. She gives her life to the Lord. And then she says, would you be willing to pray for my wrist? We prayed for her wrist and it was actually completely healed. Unbelievable. So that was a miracle. But I think of like, you know, I think of when the gospel goes forth, when Jesus goes forth, What follows it? Miracles and signs and wonders follow to prove that it is true. So that was an awesome thing. Uh, This is, 
Yeah, this is part of the nations. This is 41 nations getting together uh, at a three-day conference that we put on for them of what it could look like for the message of repentance to come to their, uh, their country. So that's a quick picture there. Okay, uh, this, this is a crazy encounter. That guy right there, uh, he is, uh, we got led to his house. Uh, we w- went out of the community, and I just felt like we were supposed to go to this house, and there was this kid there that was showering because we knocked on his door, and he says, I'm showering. I said, all right, well, I feel like we're supposed to wait for you. So he, we waited for him, and we got to share the gospel with him. He is Malawi. He's, he lives in Lilongwe, which is the capital city of Malawi. He's their best runner. The, the Malawian government hired this kid. He's 19 years old. Chikonde is his name, and uh, he's the best runner in Malawi. He's been to the Olympics, uh, and he's a sweet kid. He gave his life to the Lord oh my goodness, about five years ago, but really fell away from the Lord. So we got to encourage him, and then we brought him up on stage and let them know uh, who he is. And man, it was just an amazing, amazing. I texted him this morning. He took first place yesterday, ran 13.5 miles in uh, one hour and five minutes. Jason, the guy's amazing. Neat kid, neat kid. Next slide. So there's the counselors. Literally, uh, that was in Blantyre, Malawi. There was about 800 counselors there. Uh, once again, counselors are just, uh, we train them, equip them like we did this morning with you guys with the band. And then we go out in the community and then in the evening, these guys are in charge of uh, when people give their life to the Lord, hooking them up with school, Revive School to get discipleship. So there's that. Next slide. I think it's a video, isn't it? Yeah, listen to this video. This this was, uh, yeah, look at this. <laughs> Yeah, so so that was uh, that was every night uh, in the four cities, and it was just amazing to see thousands and thousands of people just hungering. Uh, for the message of God. So many people uh, gave their life to the Lord and were hooked up with discipleship. I've never seen uh, the amount of hunger um, ever in my life. I was, I'm was i completely transformed by it. My prayer is for America. My prayer is that we would have a president, uh, no matter what aisle you're in, pray for our president, that he would catch wind of what the Lord is doing. Um, but this president, uh, Lazarus Chuck Wera, uh, heard the call to repentance, and it's the key. It's the key to a nation turning to God, and uh, it's just an amazing time in, in Malawi. Yeah, I think we were sent there to share the gospel, but truly God gave us a gift. Uh, the gift he gave to us was to see a nation that was hungry for the Lord. They were humble to get on their knees and ask for repentance. And they received the free gift that if they did repent, that they would have freedom. And we got to see that in action. And truly, I think it's a message for us and for us to bring back to America. I think it goes right along with what Pastor Drew was preaching. Like, we need to wake up. I think we sit in America and feel pretty comfortable, and, and we think we're so blessed financially. I mean, when you, we didn't show you the pictures of the life that these people have to live. It is hard. I mean, it is hard. You cannot go there and not be convicted of how comfortable we like to be. But what they do have is they have desperation to be dependent upon the Lord. And so I feel like even here today is just a message, and the Lord just led me uh, to this scripture, and I want to end with that. And just truly a prayer, because I truly believe we're being deceived We're not standing up for the truth, and our hearts have become hardened. And I think you have to gather daily and encourage one another so we are not deceived by the sin. Um, But this is where I wanted to take us to end with here is in Ephesians 5. In verse 11, it says, Have nothing to do, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. If you go down into chapter into verse 15 it says be very careful then how you live not as unwise but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And then I, it says, I want to go down because I think what we just saw in this video and what I experienced in a nation was speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God for the Father, for everything in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. And so I just want to end us with a prayer. I think it's um, great that it's Father's Day, and I want to pray to our Heavenly Father. So Lord, we just thank you, Father, that you made us in your image. I thank you for our fathers that are here today. Father, I ask that you soften our hearts in America. I ask that you bring our minds to wisdom. That, Lord, we would get so hungry, we would fall to our knees in repentance. I thank you, Father, that you came not to shame and to condemn, but to set us free. So, Father, I pray for everyone here today, even, that they would receive your freedom in a new way. I ask, Father, you put it deep within our hearts and our spirits that we would be bold as lions, that we would stand for your word and for you, Jesus, and we would proclaim it and we would teach it, that we would go, we would baptize in your name. I thank you, Father, for each person today that gave their life and surrendered their life to you. I thank you, Father, that now they get to receive your Holy Spirit and they be, may be led and guided by you and they no longer will be deceived by the world. So we just thank you, Father, for your love, your kindness, your grace, and your mercy. And we just worship you in Jesus' name.